we still have like four minutes to go so just to get you prepared and to get my stuff prepared as well inshallah Okay. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala abdihi wa rasulihi al-Ameen Nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man ihtada bi hadyih wa istanna bi sunnatihi ila yawm al-Din Amma ba'du Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Last class we talked about the different methodologies of referring to sources of legislations and we tried to explain as much as possible why they had these different ways of thinking and what is acceptable and what is ac not acceptable now before we go into the methodology of the four schools of thought in finding means to reach a verdict or to legislate. It is extremely important, as stated before, to mention the fact that the companions did not legislate. Even the companions themselves, they did not legislate. Legislation, the Sharia, ah, comes only through the Quran and through the Sunnah. So it was the Prophet والسلام, during his lifetime, the only source of legislation. Yes, there were a number of companions who are counted on a single or both hands, who used to give fatwa in the presence of the Prophet والسلام, and during his lifetime. But the Prophet would correct them if they were to make any mistakes. So legislation, the Sharia ah itself, comes only from Allah Azza wa Jal and from His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam. Now after the death of the Prophet والسلام, the legislation was cut off. Al-Yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum. Today I have completed your religion meaning that no one can adopt something and say this is from the religion though it was not at the time of the prophet or claim that this is something that was missing so we're completing it astaghfirullah there is nothing as such yet jurisprudence was not complete in the sense that the legislation and the sharia ah are fixed Jurisprudence is something that is evolving. 
according to the Quran and to the Sunnah. And this is what makes Islam the ultimate religion to the end of time. And that there is no accepted religion with it and after it. And that there is no messenger after the Prophet or a Prophet. And this is something Muslims know by default from their own religion. So jurisprudence or fiqh is evolving because there are so many things that are happening that were not at the time of the Prophet For example, cars, the expansion of cities, the inability for the Adhan to reach certain areas. So they introduced loud speakers so that the congregation would hear. They introduced things and things that we need jurors to look into the basis of Quran and Sunnah and give us a ruling whether this or that is accepted or not. So after the Prophet ﷺ, we have the pre-doctrines stage, which is composed of the companions era and the tabi'ins era. And both are among the best of generations as the Prophet had described Wasallam. Now, if you look at the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, those who gave fatwa were approximately 130 of them. Yet, they were not all the same in their productivity regarding fatwa. So, some were plentiful, meaning that they had filled the whole world with fatwas, with knowledge. And there were seven, Umar, Ali, uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Mother Aisha, Zayd ibn Thabit, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Ibn Umar. These were 24-7 scholars of Islam, teaching, preaching, giving fatwas. The second level were the moderate. And there were 13 of the companions. Among them was Abu Bakr. And we know that Abu Bakr lived after the Prophet ﷺ by almost two years. So he did not have a lot of time to give fatwa. But yet still he is considered to be moderate in the amount of fatwas that he used to give. There was Uthman, there was Umm Salama, may Allah be pleased with her, the mother of the believers, Anas, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, Abu Huraira, a lot. Then there were those who were rare in giving fatwa, and they are the rest of the 130. Many companions, but they were not so um, uh, plentiful in giving fatwa, either because they were afraid, as a lot of the companions used to refrain from giving fatwas, due to the hadiths they ha heard from the Prophet ﷺ, uh, threatening those who speak without knowledge or because they either did not have students or they did not have knowledge at that particular uh, issue. Now, if you look at the schools of thought, of jurisprudence of the companions, it all revolved around two in Medina, one in Mecca and one in Kufa or Iraq. So the two in Medina, those who led the schools of the companions in giving fatwa and in teaching knowledge in formulating the nucleus of the schools of thought were Zayd ibn Thabit and Abdullah ibn Umar. May Allah be pleased with them. Those were in Medina. In Mecca, we know that Ibn Abbas dominated the scene there. And he's the habr of this ummah as described by the Prophet ﷺ, and he made dua uh, 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 for him وسلم, by saying, Allahumma allimhu ta'wil wa faqihhu fi deen Teach him the understanding of the Quran and the comprehension in fiqh, in deen. Then we have Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, in Iraq, in Kufa. And from there, we have the different tabi'een 
who learned from those and were able to also cascade and give their knowledge to others. So, for example, we have in Medina a great number of tabi'in who were classified as scholars. Why? Because the vast majority of companions were still in Medina, did not go out. Only a handful left to Iraq or to Sham or to Egypt or elsewhere. So among the tabi'in, we had the seven jurors, al-fuqaha al-sab'a. We had Nafi', we had Sa Nafi' Mawla ibn Umar. And we had also Salim, the son of Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be uh, uh, pleased with them all. And we had also uh, a Zuhri. These guys, they were prominent and they were well known in Medina, had many students, kept the knowledge intact. If you go to Mecca, you'll find that the students of Ibn Abbas, like Ata, Tawus, Mujahid, Ikrimah, were also teaching the people and spreading the fiqh of Ibn Abbas, narrating or reporting the hadiths that Ibn Abbas had heard. So they managed to do this. In Al-Basra, Iraq, you had Hassan al-Basri, Ibn Sirin, Abu Qulaba, and Qatada. And in Al-Kufa, which is also in Iraq, you have Alqama uh, and his student Ibrahim al nakhi you had Masruq, you had uh, uh, others uh, like Shurayh and uh, other scholars. Now, if you look at the reason of these great scholars differing, why? If it's the same Quran and it's the same Sunnah, well, this issue needs a lot of studying and examples which we are unable to uh, um, afford in such a class. Why? There's a booklet in Arabic, I don't know if it's translated, definitely it has to be translated, by Ibn Taymiyyah. May Allah have mercy on his soul. It's called Raf'ul Malam Anil A'immat Al-A'lam. It translates roughly to stopping the blame upon the great Imams. Why do we blame them? Because they differed. Why would they differ if it's the same, same Quran and the same Sunnah? Ibn Taymiyyah explains that the reason of difference of opinions is greatly attributed to the evidence, whether it is authentic or not. And if it's authentic, whether it fits the situation or not. And if it fits the situation, whether there is something else abrogated it or not, whether the understanding is complete or there are exceptions for that particular evidence. And he gave a lot of reasons. For example, the companions themselves, may Allah be pleased with them, were addressed by a command from the Prophet ﷺ after the Battle of Trench when the idol worshippers dispersed and went back to their homes, the Prophet ﷺ had to deal with the Jews of Bani Quraydha who broke the treaty. Not only that, plotted to kill the Prophet ﷺ and to aid and assist the disbelievers in attacking Medina. So the Prophet ﷺ addressed the companions and said, none of you should pray Asr except in Bani Quraydha. Of course, this was addressed to them at the time of Dhuhr. Asr was not called for yet. So they marched. And in the middle of the way, the sun was about to set. Yet they did not reach Bani Quraydha. So they were divided into two groups. One said, we have to pray Asr before the sun sets because then the time would be over and the Prophet only said what he had said 
alayhi salatu wasalam, only to encourage us to be haste and to quickly make it to Bani Quraidah, not to skip salah. The other group said, the command of the Prophet is crystal clear, and he is the one that gives us direction whether to go or not, whether to pray or not. So they differed, and hence the second group did not pray until the sun set and they reached Bani Quraidah. The first group, they prayed their prayer and then continued to march to Bani Quraidah, reaching there like 10 minutes after the second group. When they ar arrived, they told the Prophet ﷺ of their dispute. Now, why would two great groups of the companions differ over a command of the Prophet ﷺ? Once you understand that they had differed in such a command, then you can cascade this down to all Quran and Sunnah and understand where different ulama, different scholars, different uh, companions differ and where they're coming from. So, if you understand this, then you start to appreciate the great work of the companions and the great work of the ulama themselves, the scholars. Now, having said that, we have an issue. This issue is that the most prominent schools of thought at the moment are four. The Hanafi school, the Maliki school, the Shafi'i school, and the Hanbali school. But people have divided into two groups or three. Who's counting? The first group idealizes these schools of thought. So they, th they think and believe whatever the Imam had said, then this is close to revelation. We have to blindly follow it and believe in it. The second group were those who totally neglected their work of the schools of thought, discredited it, looked down upon them, and maybe even insulted them, saying that they are men and we are men as well. And this is an exaggeration or an understatement. So they totally neglected the work of the great scholars of Islam. Now, the middle path is the path of our scholars, our a'imma, our ulama, which is that we highly look up to these great imams while not blindly following them, rather appreciating their work, appreciating their lifetime achievements and what they have given to the ummah. But at the same time, due to the fact that they are not all in agreement, in this case, we have to implement what Allah has told us in the Quran, and that is, whenever you have a dispute over something, refer it back to Allah and to the Messenger meaning to the Quran and to the Sunnah. So we believe highly in Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, and Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. But when one of them goes a little bit offline, or when they dispute, we have to cross-examine their evidences so that we can come to a conclusion. For example, Al Imam al Shafi'i, may Allah have mercy on his soul, says that touching a woman, whether she's your mother or your wife, 
or a total stranger nullifies your wudu. The other three great imams of the schools of thought say this is not true. It does not impact your wudu with difference of opinion whether if it is done with desire and lust or not. But there is a difference of opinion among scholars. Imam Shafi'i says, regardless, it nullifies your wudu. So, where did you get this from? He said, I found that in chapter 4, Surah An-Nisa. Allah says, Awla mastumun nisa in the ayah of tayammum in Surah An-Nisa. The ayah of wudu and tayammum. So he says that this is clear that touching the women is something that nullifies wudu. And it's also found in Surah uh, uh, Al-Ma'idah as well, in the, in the very beginning. The other scholars said, no, the understanding of the ayah was wrong. La mastumun nisa means to have intercourse, not to touch. So it breaks your wudu and you have to have ghusl. And if you don't have water, you have to perform tayammum. This is something that tayammum is made for if you lack water. That is, if you are in the se uh, sexual uh, uh, ritual impurity, the major ritual impurity. So now he understood the ayah differently from the others. So who to follow? Is, uh, do, are we supposed to follow the earliest one of the imams, who is Abu Hanifa, because he's closer to the tabi'een? Or should we follow Imam Ahmad, who is the latest of the four imams who had the ability to look into different schools of thought and different opinions? Well, the most authentic way of doing it is to refer it back to the Quran and Sunnah. And we will find in the Sunnah that Mother Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, told her nephew uh, uh, Urwa ibn Zubair, that the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, may, kissed, may have kissed one of his wives and then went for prayer without renewing his wudu. And Urwa said, I bet that this wife was you, Mother Aisha, and she laughed or smiled. This hadith clearly states that kissing your spouse, not just touching, does not impact your wudu. And this is the most authentic opinion among scholars. And this is why it is important for us to know exactly where these scholars were coming from and why they differed. One may ask, why then only four? Well, actually, if you remember a while ago, I mentioned the students of Medina, al fuqaha al Sab'a, Nafir, Salim, all of these great jurors of Medina, great jurors of Mecca, of Kufa, of Basra. But the problem is that there were great scholars other than these four Imams, maybe even greater than them, in knowledge and else. Uh, uh, and other things. For example, Malik ibn Anas was the Imam of Medina, but everyone knows that Al Layth ibn Sa'd was the judge of Egypt, and the contemporaries say that he was more knowledgeable than Malik. We know that there was Sufyan ibn Uyayna, there was Sufyan al Thawri, there was Abdullah ibn Mubarak, there was Al Awza'i in Lebanon, there was uh, uh, Ibrahim al Nakhri. Great, great scholars heavy duty, but they did not have schools of thought. So why were those or these four great Imams having such large followers while these other greater Imams were unfortunate not to have? Scholars say that this was due to the number of students. See, when you have a great number of students 
to carry your knowledge and spread it worldwide, then you have a name, a reputation, and a school that is followed. But if you're a great scholar, one of the greatest, yet you are not blessed with students who take care of your knowledge and embrace it as their own and work hard to spread it worldwide, your knowledge will die after a few years. So if you look at these four, four schools of thought, let it be known that they were not the only scholars of their times. They were far greater scholars than them, but Allah Azza wa Jal gave their work prominence and made it spread all over the world for a wisdom he only Allah Azza wa Jal knows about. Also, it is worth noting that these four Imams were not a one-man show. Rather, if you look at their biography, you will find that, for example, Imam Abu Hanifa had a great number of scholars to learn from. And he did not assume the position of teaching until he was like 40 years of age when his sheikh, his scholar teacher died and he assumed his place. Also, if you look at Imam Malik, among his teachers were the descendants of companions. So the sons of the companions and their sons, he had 900 of them. No wonder he did not have to leave Medina to seek knowledge like all other scholars. Yet he was permitted to give fatwa as a, at a very early age. Imam Shafi'i likewise, he was 15 when he started giving fatwa and teaching. He was 15. Others at this age, maybe even older, are preoccupied by PUBG or playing Fortnite. Not Imam Shafi'i. Imam Shafi'i stayed in Mecca learning Arabic, Quran, and Hadith, and Fiqh, and then went to Medina, where he became the student of Imam Malik, and learned Imam Malik's Fiqh and knowledge from him. And he said that no one has any right over me more than Imam Malik, as he is my teacher, and I benefited a lot from him. If you look at Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, a man who traveled all over the world to listen to the hadith, to compile the hadith. He went from Baghdad to uh, the areas near Persia and, and, and Khurasan, what's after the river they call it. He went to Al Yemen, he went to Mecca, he went to Medina. He traveled like crazy. But look what was the result being Imam Ahlu Sunnati Wal Jama'ah. So they've learned from those who came before them. And they would not give something that is out of the blue except after implementing this knowledge that they had uh, received from those who were before them. So let us look quickly, not in details, about these schools of thought. The first one was Imam Abu Hanifa, Ibn Nu'man, may Allah have mercy on his soul. He was born on the 80th of Hijrah, lived for 70 years and died at the, uh, at the age of 70 on the uh, uh, 150th year of Hijrah. Imam Malik was born in the 93rd year of Hijrah and lived for 82 years to die on the 179th. Imam Shafi'i was born 
on the same year that Imam Abu Hanifa died, which is 150. And he died in the year 204, living only 50 years of age, subhanAllah. He died young. While Al Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, may Allah have mercy on his soul, was born in the year 164 and died in 241, making him approximately 77 years of age. If you look at those who mentioned Al Imam Abu Hanifa, Al Imam uh, uh, Malik, Al Imam Al Shafi'i, you will not have an end. Imam Malik said, I've, I've seen someone who, if he were to talk to you about this pillar in the masjid, that it is made of gold, you would have been convinced. Al the, the, the history of the Hanafi school of thought is quite wide. And there are, for example, uh, methodologies of Al Imam Abu Hanifa way of thinking. Now, all the four schools of thought agree that Quran, Sunnah, Ijma, and Qiyas. They have no problem in these four. Quran and Sunnah and Ijma, this is totally accepted by all. Qiyas, some may delay it a point or two. Some may give it preference as a fourth source of legislation. Now, if you look at other schools of thought, like a Zahiriya school of thought, which was prominently led by Ibn Hazm, they totally disregard Qiyas. And they totally disregard the schools of thought as well. And it is not something that people usually devote time to study, though they have many good points, especially when the jurors get out of track and they start thinking of al-istihsan, al-masalih, al-mursala, and they expand over that, leaving a Quran and Sunnah aside. This is where we have to confront them with the Zahiri, a school of thought that would bring them back in line. So Imam Abu Hanifa, his methodology was that Quran and Sunnah, we don't have any issues with that. Whatever hadith comes to us from the Prophet ﷺ, it is taken blindly. But when, it, when we get a hadith from the companions, so if the, all the companions agreed upon something which is not mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah, this is consensus, we have no problem in that. But if they differ, Abu Hanifa says, I apply my reasoning and I follow one of them, but I cannot follow an opinion out of the opinions of the companions. Their opinions are binding, but not each and every one, because they differed. And truth can only be one at the side of Allah, by the way. So when you hear someone of dispute, it doesn't mean that you can cherry pick. Cherry picking is haram. Because you're not picking what is according, in accordance to the Quran and Sunnah, but rather in accordance to your own whims and desire. So this is totally prohibited. You have to implement the tools that you have. The Quran and the Sunnah, the Ijma, the Qiyas, and do what is necessary to be done to reach what Allah wants you to reach. But when you come to an issue like smoking, this says haram, this says halal, I'll, I'll take halal. No, this is cherry picking. You cannot do this. So Imam Abu Hanifa used his personal reasoning. And this is a separate school of thought. It's called Ahlul Ra'i. Those who implement their reasoning in understanding. So even in tafsir, you have the school of thought of reasoning in tafsir and the school of thought of hadith, of al-athar. 
that they cannot interpret or give tafsir to an ayah without any hadith relating to the Prophet ﷺ, to companion, tabi'een, tabi'it, tabi'een, some of the salaf. While the people of reasoning, like Al-Qurtubi for example, he would look into the verses, implement his Arabic language, look around and try to come up with tafsir and benefits of that. And each school has its merits. So we do not overlook one school over the other. So Imam Abu Hanifa says, when the companions differ, I will choose one of their opinions according to my reasoning. But it has to be backed up by the companions themselves, one of them at least. And if the companions had no say in what this issue requires saying, Al-Imam Abu Hanifa says, I will not follow Ibrahim or Sufyan, Tom, Dick or Harry. Rather, as they are men like I am, I will implement my reasoning and reach to the same uh, a verdict or differently by following the same process they had followed. So where did Ibrahim and Nakhi come up with this verdict? He looked into the Quran, to the Sunnah and did ishtihad and came up with this verdict. Imam Abu Hanifa says, I'll do exactly the same. Now, if you go to Imam Malik ibn Anas, Imam Malik, may Allah have mercy on his soul, was born in Medina, learned from the people of Medina who were among the tabi'een uh, and tabi'i tabi'een, which brings us to an issue I forgot. Was Abu Hanifa from the tabi'een or tabi'i tabi'een? It's an issue of dispute and the most authentic opinion that he did see one or two companions. Yet he did not report any uh, uh, of them. He did not hear hadith from them. But just visually seeing them makes him among the tabi'i tabi'in, which is an honor by itself. As for Imam Malik, he was among the tabi'i tabi'in. And the best of Tabi'at Tabi'in or Tabi'at Tabi'at Tabi'in, uh, either one. His most famous chain of narrations, which is the closest, is Malik reporting through Nafi', reporting through Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, that the Prophet Sallallahu said so and so. So this is so close that you have only three generations between you and the Prophet and this is what, why they call it the golden chain of narrators. Malik an Nafi' an Ibn Umar an al Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam, which makes him a tabi'i tabi'in. Because Nafi' was a tabi'i, a tabi'i is the one who saw the companion, and Malik saw the uh, uh, tabi'i, uh, ta tabi which makes him a tabi'i a tabi'in. Now, uh, um, the methodology of Imam Malik, as stated before, is almost the same. They follow the Quran and the Sunnah and the consensus. Then he believes in what is known as Amalu Ahl al Medina, the doing of the people of Medina. So he says that I live in Medina, and all those around me in Medina are the descendants of the companions. So if they all do something, though we don't have backing up of that thing they're doing to the Quran or to the Sunnah, but they are doing it, this means that it is part of the deen because they are the descendants of the companions and they were not influenced by others. So this is one of the way of uh, uh, the sources of legislation in the Maliki fiqh. Uh, or the Maliki school of thought. The saying of the companions is always given uh, uh, priority and he also believes in the uh, uh, interests without ruling and masalih al-mursala, customs of the Muslims al-urf, prevention of what leads to prohibition which is siddu uh, al-dara'i' and istishab and the subtle analogy etc. Now 
having said that, Al Imam Malik did not have books of his own detailing his methodology of thinking or the way of his fiqh. And if you look at Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Abu Hanifa used to reason a lot. And he used to consult a lot. Yani it was known through his biography that his circles of knowledge dependent, depended a lot upon consultation. He would sit with great scholars of his time. Most of them are his students. Uh, Abu Yusuf, al Hassan al-Shaybani. And he would ask them a question. And they would deliberate upon that question until they reach a conclusion which through you can tell the methodology of thinking and process uh, uh, in his fiqh. And this is why it was documented. He said this by himself and it was documented by his students. Imam Malik was different. He was more inclined, may Allah have mercy on his soul, on the hadith, on the athar, on the reporting of the salaf, not something that he just simply improvises but rather it has to be backed by a saying a statement by Ata or by Tawus or by Qatada or by Ikrimah it has to be something backed up when an Imam a Shafi came then this was much different because he thought highly of an Imam Abu Hanifa though he they did not meet Abu Hanifa died on the uh, year 150 Imam Shafi'i was born in the year 150. So they did not get to meet. But he thought highly of Al Imam Abu Hanifa because he, th he used to say that all people are children to Imam Abu Hanifa when it comes to fiqh, which means that he highly recognizes his level of intellect and knowledge. And when it comes to Imam Malik, who was so devote to Al-Hadith, he also took part of that and combined it with Al-Fiqh. So he took Fiqh from Abu Hanifa, he took Hadith from Imam Malik, combined both together and came with his school of thought. He used to think highly of Imam Malik, as stated earlier. And this is what gave his school of thought a blend. Now, a man who dies at the age of 54, no print houses, no uh, uh, electronic gadgets, had a photographic memory, had to travel from one area to the other in a month or two. This means that the time that he had spent writing and teaching and learning was so blessed beyond today's measurements. Now, Imam Shafi'i believed in the Quran, the Sunnah and Ijma' and he believed in the statements of the companion, yet he would also look into the companion's different opinions and select whatever was in accordance to the Quran, to the Sunnah, rather than just simply applying his reasoning. No, he would have to refer that back to the Quran and to the Sunnah and would use a lot the issue of analogy. So the, the, the issue of analogy is quite prominent, Al-Qiyas is quite prominent in Imam Shafi'i's school of thought. He also did not like istihsan. And he said that whoever does istihsan, then he has legislated and he used to be very harsh on people uh, uh, giving this. And if we look at Al Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, now, uh, by the way, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, before him, Imam Shafi'i, were both orphans and were raised by their moms. So imagine the great reward 
their mothers have now in paradise because of what they had done with their children, how they managed to take care of them financially and to tell them, devote your time to seeking knowledge. I will provide for you food, money, etc. Don't worry about anything else. And this is a very important point that mothers should pay attention to. Your role is not neglig uh, negligible. Your role is so important that it has, with the grace of Allah, the ability to make an imam or to break one. You can have your children becoming imams, influential people who impact others in Islam and getting them closer to Allah. And you can make them artists, singers, rubbish people. This is in your hand. So you have to put a lot of sincerity into it, make a lot of dua and put effort. Nothing comes easy in life. Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal traveled all over the world. The Arabian world and the world where he could collect hadith. And he did not have money. He used to hire himself as a laborer, carrying things in the souk just for having dinner. One meal would suffice. And he used to travel and write and refuse to mix with the rulers who could make him filthy rich. But he would not do that. And he would only sit to teach. He collected his great book, Musnad al-Imam Ahmad, which has something over 20, 30,000 hadith. Some even say that it is 40,000 hadiths compiled in that. It's a great book of hadiths. And he did not have, in a sense, a specific fiqh of his own because he's more related to a uh, hadith rather than fiqh. Yet this is unfair because he did have his own fiqh. His students have also done a lot of great work to uh, uh, spread the works of his. I think we have a couple of minutes before we start taking your questions and I hope our moderators have sent me the question, the email. We will find, uh, soon find out. Okay, the Hanafi school is a reputable school of thought. They have a lot of imams and books. So we have uh, uh, the greatest reference in the Hanafi school is uh, Ibn Abdin's Radd al-Muhtar. Uh, we also have Badaya uh, Sanayi' Bal Kasani, and and so many books and references, specifically on the fiqh of Imam Abu Hanifa. But bear in mind, those who came after the four Imams, their students, did not always quote the Imams' verdicts. Rather, they made a methodology of the process of thinking of the Imam and said that the Imam had mentioned so and so and if it were to him he would have answered in, a, in this fashion okay but he didn't he said yeah yeah but we follow his school of thought and we managed to draw a road map of the way that the Imam used to think and this is what we came up with. So many of these books that are related to Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad, they're not actually representing the Imam himself. Rather, it, they are representing the school, which means that so many times you say that the opinion of Al-Hanbali school of thought is so and so and if you go back and track you will find that Imam Ahmed had never said anything like that or maybe you'll find that he said something contrary to that but they selected what falls under the roadmap they made thinking that this fits his way of thinking as a glove so these books might have 
things that did not happen. What happens if a person prays on a mattress between the heavens and the earth? Is his prayer valid or not? This did not happen at that time. But they came up with things and things and they started giving fatwas according to the, their understanding of what Imam uh, Abu Hanifa would uh, say. You have also uh, in uh, Imam Malik's school of thought, Al-Mudawwana of Sahnun and Mukhtasar Al-Khalil and there's so many interpretations of that. In Imam Shafi'i, he himself wrote the great kitab of Al-Um and also he composed one of the first books, if not the first books in Usul al-Fiqh known as Al-Risala. But he had also great students and scholars such as Imam Nawawi who wrote the book uh, uh, Minhaj al-Talibin and this was also uh, interpreted by in Hayat al-Muhtaj, Tuhfat al-Muhtaj, Mughni al-Muhtaj for many other schools, scholars of, of, of uh, the uh, Shafi'i Madhab. For Imam uh, Ahmed ibn Muhammad ibn Hanbal, may Allah have mercy on his soul, there is Al-Insaf uh, uh, for uh, Al-Mardawi and also you have Al-Furu' ibn Muflih and uh, Al-Bahuti wrote Kashf Al-Qina' and others were also so many books among the contemporaries I would say that Sharh al mumtah of Sheikh ibn Uthaymeen, may Allah have mercy on his soul, is one of the most elaborate and beautifully written, though they were not essentially written, they were classes in his masjid, but then they were uh, uh, written by his students from his cassettes and recordings. And it's a great encyclopedia to learn the, the Hanbali madhab and what is the correct an authentic opinion of scholars uh, mentioned elsewhere and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. We have, mashallah, 13 questions which definitely won't have time for. Uh, Rabia Shumail says, is it appropriate that one follows some things from one school of thought and some from other because essentially they are all right? No, this is not right. You cannot say that all schools of thought are right in particulars, but they are right in general. So, over an issue such as touching the woman, does it nullify wudu or not? We've stated that Imam Shafi'i says it does. The other three schools said it does not. So, who should we follow? Can we say both are right? It can't be. You either nullify your wudu or not. So, one of them is right. And the truth at the side of Allah is one. But when we have difference of opinion among scholars, we have to look, are we students of knowledge or laymen? If I am a layman, then I must not cherry pick or look and select. I have to follow one imam, whether from the four schools of thought or from a contemporary imam who is the mujtahid and I believe in what he says and I follow him. If I'm a layman, but if I am a student of knowledge, I have knowledge in Arabic, I have knowledge in the Quran, the Sunnah, and I can tell which is authentic, which is not authentic. In this case, I have to implement my own knowledge in trying to find out which one is the most authentic opinion. Her second uh, question was, uh, well, actually, this is from Muhammad Ahmed, a second person. Most of the countries not following the Islamic law, countries like India, proposing uniform civil code. So how Islamic jurisprudence is useful and practical in modern world? Well, Muhammad, what Kafir countries say, or countries that are Islamic, but not implementing Sharia, they enforce their own laws, while we as Muslims are obliged by Allah to follow the Sharia law. Here we come to a fork of the road because Allah tells us this is haram and the government forces us to do something that goes against our religion or prohibits us from doing something that is permitted in our religion. 
Here we have to weigh the pros and cons. We cannot simply renegade and say, no, I'll not do this, I will do. And the consequences, the disadvantages, the cons far exceed the pros and the advantages. And I'll give you an example. The government comes and says, you have to insure your motor vehicle. We go to the scholars and they say, no, insurance is totally haram. It is gambling. It's prohibited. So now I have a, a choice either to get car insurance due to necessity or end up in jail. Definitely you getting a car insurance that you abhor and hate and you take the bare minimum, which is the third party insurance, not the full coverage, but the, the bare minimum would be allowed due to necessity, like when you are in the desert, starving, about to die, and there's only dog's meat or donkey's meat or pork that you can eat. No one would say, Ma'assalama, adios, die and we will pray for you. Rather, you have to eat for necessity and Allah knows best. Mim Minit, Assalamu Alaikum Wa Alaikum If you are ill and they cannot do anything about it and you try, you tried everything, uh, Dua, Sunnah, uh, and still it gets worse. Don't I become desperate about it? What can I do? Well, you can't do anything but to continue making dua, hoping that Allah Azza wa would reward you for it. Because at the end of the day, it is not Simon says and it happens. It is not making dua and boom, it's in front of me. No, you are a slave of Allah Azza wa If Allah chooses to torture you for 60 years of your age and then throws you in hell, you cannot complain. You cannot object. You cannot do anything about it. You are Allah's property. So the only way for you out is to acknowledge my life in this life is a mere test. Allah Azza wa Jal is testing us. So you have to acknowledge the fact that what you're going through is a test from Allah. And you have no alternative, no choice, but to be patient, to be content, not to object, not to complain, but rather acknowledge that all what is happening to you has been preordained 50,000 years before Allah created the creation. So it's done and over with. You cry, you bang your head on the wall, you throw yourself from a high riser, you drown yourself, everything was predestined and you'll be punished for your action. So the only alternative to have is to be content that Allah Azza wa Jal is wise, fair, knowledgeable. He, whatever he predestines upon me is for a better reason and I have no alternative except to be patient. Few days and we will all meet our maker and Allah makes it easy for all of us. Kalthum says, uh, what is the best to ask in dua? Ya Allah, grant us the intercession of the Prophet ﷺ, or Ya Allah, make us among those who will enter Jannah without accountability. Of course, the second. It is illogical to ask for the Prophet's intercession because this is something you will get if you deserve it. But to ask for the result without ensuring that you have fulfilled the prerequisites, that's not logical. So, okay, what is the reason for ask for, for the intercession of the Prophet Asam to enter Jannah? So should I ask for the intercession or should I ask Allah to immediately take me to Jannah? Of course, this is the most logical thing to do. Second question, is it necessary to take knowledge from those scholars who whose chain are attached to the Prophet I heard this from a Salafi scholar. No, this is not true. This is not true simply because a lot of these 
so-called scholars might not be genuine. I remember seeing one of a video clip of a deviant super Sufi who's always smiling like this. I think he's got cramps in his, his, his face. He's, mashallah, he's, uh, he's always smiling. And he was saying that this turban, the white turban I'm having on my head, which is, wow, so clean. He said this, I got it from my sheikh, so-and-so in Hadramut. And then I, he got it from his, and he names like 30 people who are acclaimed, supposed to be scholars. You don't know them, I don't know them. And I doubt if he can memorize their names and say it again. But for the sake of argument. And he said they got it from so-and-so, Ali ibn Abi Talib, uh, who got it from the Prophet ﷺ. Now, do you mean to tell me that this turban, which is remarkably white, has lived for 15 centuries and reached you this clean? What kind of a fabric is this? Even Superman can't afford something like that. So this is a blatant lie. You can tell it is definitely a lie by a blatant liar. So not necessarily, yes, there are well-known scholars of Hadith, of Sunnah, who are acknowledged as reputable scholars who have this chain of narrators, but it doesn't make a difference whether I take it from them or I read it from Sahih al-Bukhari itself, because it's the same knowledge and Allah knows uh, best. So Hail says, you said that there is no Qada prayer other than sleeping and forgetting after that time ends. I've found some references where the Prophet ﷺ, uh, uh, be up on him prayer, Asr, Salat before Maghrib when he was unable to pray. Can you please explain? I don't know what your question is, Suhail. Most likely you're referring to the incidents of the Battle of the Trench where all the Muslims were surrounded by about 5,000 of the idol worshippers. They're all warriors anticipating the moment to penetrate Medina uh, uh, defense lines and kill every Muslim they can see. So for a whole month they were afraid. There were skirmishes between the two sides. In one incident, the Umar ibn Khattab came to the Prophet and said, May Allah curse the idol worshippers. I barely prayed Asr before sun, the sun set, the Prophet said, Aslam, may Allah fill their graves and stomachs with fire. I didn't pray Asr yet. So if this is your question, Akhi, the Prophet Aslam, did not pray Asr because it was out of forgetfulness. He was anticipating the attack. He was uh, getting the forces ready. He was checking that there were no uh, uh, loopholes in the defenses of the Muslims. Not that he simply neglected it or forgot it. No, he did not remember it until he was so preoccupied until the sun uh, uh, had set and Allah knows best. Uh, Asma says, in Pakistan, when it's 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal, in schools, they sing nasheed. At times, these nasheeds are a salam to Prophet salam, where they stand and face Kaaba and offer salutation and think the Prophet has arrived. Is it right? They also said that the one who recites na'at, grave torment, will not touch him. Is this right? All of these are innovations. All of these are means of shirk thinking that the Prophet is Hazir Nazir, as the Brelvis think, and that whenever you uh, offer a maulid for him, his soul comes and blesses it, and they put water and food, so that after the gathering is over, they take the food and water and give it to their sick people as a form of uh, uh, healing and, and cure. All of this is nonsense and innovation. As for the na'at, and it would save you from the torment of the grave. Na'at is praising the Prophet ﷺ through nasheed. This is also uh, baseless and nonsense. Fatima says, Our deen Islam highly recommends kindness and equality, but at times it's so hard to implement. For example, we don't like to sit uh, by, shake hands 
with and hug a dirty uh, person, though we try to. How to overcome such bad habit? How to implement equality, kindness among people in such situations? This would be the last question, inshallah. Fatima, this is not logical. Islam calls for us to love one another, but it also orders us to clean ourselves. So if someone is dirty or someone is uh, uh, um, bad or smelling or someone that is repulsive, this is human nature not to want to shake hands or to hug or to come close to such a person. So if someone comes with uh, impurities in his hand and he wants to shake my hands and I say, okay, part of equality of Islam, I have to... No, definitely not. Islam doesn't promote or recommend such an action. So, yes, you have to show equality in affection if you have someone who's black and someone who's white. Part of not being racist is to treat them equally and not to favor one over the other just because of their race or their color or their uh, social status. This is part of not uh, uh, discriminating upon or, or among Muslims and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. And with this, we come to the conclusion of today's lesson. Until we meet you next Thursday, I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.